Dr. Khatija Irfan is one of the leading endocrinologists and diabetologists of the country, and uh, we are very pleased to have her, her with us as a speaker. Please welcome Dr. Khatija. Assalamu alaikum, and thank you for the very kind introduction. And uh, can you see my slide? So I hope everybody is uh, well rested and awake because we are going to have a pretty busy presentation today. Okay, two pictures in front of you. And this is exactly what I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to be talking about how can we bring quality into our diabetes care. So this is going to be the whole gist of my talk. But before uh, I start my talk, a little question. We see this almost every day. A young woman who comes to the diabetes clinic is a type 1 diabetic patient for a long time now, and yet she is now pregnant, had an HbA1c which was 8% one year ago. So a little bit of word association study. Uh, I, audience, uh, just a word association. What's the first thing which comes into your mind? Any word, speak out. Control. Yeah. Poorly control. Poorly control. Complications. Complications. What else? Associations. Associations. Somebody else would say compliance. So these are the things which we know, and we immediately become very judgmental when we see a patient like this. We say, not a good patient. Really, she should have been more up to it. But what about her expectations? What are her expectations at the end of this pregnancy? So again, some volunteers? A healthy baby. Healthy baby. Anybody? Oh, true, some apprehensions. She wants care, she wants to get better. I mean, she's not her own enemy. She wants to get better. When we were becoming so judgmental about her, uh, why are we forgetting that she wants the best? So she wants a quality care. So what is quality in healthcare? It is a big term. When we say, I am going to give you quality care, it's not a small thing, it's a big thing. It's an umbrella. And this umbrella involves the, health, the, the care she's provided should be safe, effective. It should get her better. It shouldn't cost an arm and a leg. And it should be addressing her concerns, what is important to her. And that, in a nutshell, is what quality is. We have an acronym, just so that we can remember that. Because if any of these domains fails, that is where healthcare quality is lacking, and that is where there is an avenue for quality improvement. So a brief outline of my talk, because this is something which is not so very familiar to us. Uh, we will be briefly discussing some terminology, uh, a lexicon, you might say, a glossary of terms related to quality. And then I'm going to go straight to the practical tips on how to go about bringing quality, that is a quality toolkit, and finally I'll share some evidence with you. So the quality lexicon. Do names matter? In the words of Shakespeare, no. So. Um, when you saw my title talk, there was quality assurance and quality uh, improvement. Are they the same things? Is there a difference? Is there a difference? How so, Dr. Fat? Dr. Fawad does very well in examinations, I can tell you that. He's a master of MCQs. <laughs> so these are related terms. And they ultimately have the same aim, better patient experience, better patient care. And therefore, they're often used interchangeably. But there are some differences, some differences in approach and differences in the tools we use to uh, ensure either of them. So first of all, quality assurance. Quality assurance deals with quality standards and maintaining quality standards. And by doing that, assuring that the patient is getting quality care. There are many strategies you do. So first of all, you identify the standards, you bring in the relevant policies so that those standards are met, and then you audit your performance. 
time after time to make sure that those standards are being met. And if, for instance, those standards are not met, then you have a system of incident reporting. And uh, you should also be a part of uh, a group like this, who can actually help you benchmark your own quality, the kind of care you're providing. Is it across the board the same? Or are some people doing better than us? On the other hand, quality improvement doesn't so slavishly adhere with standards. Instead, it aims to bring about a holistic change, an improvement in diabetes care. And this is done through a very systematic and methodologi methodological approach. So you understand, you use certain uh, tools to achieve the improvement, and then you monitor that change. And today, in this talk, I'm also going to be discussing those tools. So this is for Dr. Fawad. If he gets that question in the exam. <laughs> so quality assurance and quality improvement both aim for a better patient care. But quality assurance makes sure that you are achieving defined standards and requirements. And therefore, if there are any problems, you identify them. So it's a reactive approach. You look for problems, you correct them. Now, quality improvement is something else. It's a little bit beyond that. So whereas quality assurance is also part of the bigger picture of quality improvement, quality improvement, when we talk per se, means that you're improving your processes and systems in a more generalized way. And you, by doing that, you want to prevent the problems from recurring. So it's a more proactive approach. So two more terms I've been using in the past. So do we know these, Dr. Fawad? What's the standard, what's the benchmark? OK, this you had to read. OK, a bit too much on the slide. So standards are generally something, it's a regulatory, maybe a regulatory standard. So remember the famous MSTS, which is our uh, bane of our existence these days? So we have to meet the minimum service delivery standards of the government. So it may be a regulatory standard, or it may be a standards of care, such as the NICE standards, or the ADA standards of care. So these are standards which have been published based upon evidence, which we have to meet. And the benchmark is a little bit different. It means that to what extent we must meet the standards. So should we have every one of the ADA standards in place? Yes. Theoretically, but what about the pragmatic reality? So benchmark uh, sets a minimum performance expectation. And that is done uh, when you're factoring in the best standards, but at the same time, some pragmatic realities. So uh, let me put it visually. So consider any parameter. Um, number of hypoglycemia episodes in a diabetic patient? Uh, how often do you get HbA1c done? Uh, at what time should a woman with just a, uh, with a pregnant woman should have her uh, oral glucose tolerance test done? There are certain standards. Standards have been achieved. So imagine there are many services in the area. When I say services, I mean hospitals. So many hospitals, many clinics in the area. So we, we uh, decided that at least 80% of our women should have an appropriately timed oral glucose tolerance test. And then we looked into a collaborative, a registry, a group of people who are working together, and, or a national audit data, and we say that, uh, well, I think that 80% would be a good figure I would be happy with, to start with. And then service A, we see, we go around. Service A is, uh, let's say, Dr. Fawad's service. And it's doing it in 95% of the time. It's very good. It's exceeding the expect expected standard. Service B, maybe 60%. So it's fairly good, but it's not quite reached where it should reach. Service C is pretty bad. It's on 25%. Bare, hardly ever the patients go and get their oral glucose tolerance test done in pregnancy. So, so many G, uh, GDMs are being missed. So quality assurance is that 
at least achieve that standard or benchmark. So we set a standard, 80% of the time, all our patients, 80% of patients should be getting this timely. There may be certain circumstances beyond our control, remote areas, somewhere in the wilds of, um, well, some very, very uh, inaccessible area. Maybe this is not a, a possible. But in the majority of cases, we should be achieving this benchmark. So quality assurance means that at least the service B and C should sort of like pull up their socks and get up there. Service A is doing very well. On the other hand, quality improvement doesn't slow slavishly adhere to a benchmark or a standard. Any improvement is improvement. So C to B is an improvement, B to A is an improvement, and A to A plus is an improvement, whatever you want to do. So quality improvement, and quality improvement is done cyclically. So it may be continuous quality improvement. So you do a little bit more, C got to B, then it did something else, from B got to uh, benchmark and then got e beyond A. So this is continuous quality improvement. Okay, so much about theory. Should we take a breather? Okay, so now as I promised the rest of my talk is going to be intensely practical. How do we improve quality? And therefore, what I would like to share is a quality toolkit. And I'm going to be very, very specific because it's a brief talk. So I'm going to talk about two aspects of quality improvement. How to do a clinical audit and how to do a quality improvement project. And what are the some skills we need to do to uh, gather to do them. So uh, clinical audit is basically a quality assurance tool. And yes, it is also a quality improvement tool. But it may, it, its aim is to measure our quality of care against an agreed standard or national benchmark. And you remember in my infographic before, that was what quality assurance was all about. So the aim is to reach a benchmark. It generally tends to be like your financial audit. You have audit every year. So it tends to be a cyclical process. You do it at regular intervals to make sure that your practice is working as it should be working. Example, you can do a retinopathy screening audit. And a typical audit cycle, it's a cycle, as I said, you begin by identifying a problem, such as what I just said, that our people are coming with GDM, getting diagnosed with GDM in the 38th week of pregnancy. So we say the diagnosis is delayed. Then we define standards. What do the guidelines say? And we recommend that this is the time when they should have the GDM screening in a high-risk population. Uh, then what we do is we collect data. Over a week, we see all our patients who are coming uh, for the uh, GTT clinic and see that what is gestational age of that time. And we find that only 50% of them are coming at the right time. The rest are all late. So then we do the analysis of the data and we see, that the, see the gap analysis. Our aim was that at least 95% should be reaching this and indeed only 50% of them are reaching this target. Then we do some thinking, sit at the storyboard together, find out what can we do to achieve this standard. Maybe we need to have better liaison with the antenatal clinic. Maybe we need to have one of our persons sitting there in the antenatal clinic and making sure that the patients are booked right there and then for their GTT. So whatever we find, we implement that change. And after implementing the change, after a period of time, we re-audit and see how many patients are now being appropriately doing their GTT. So cyclically, this is repeated again and again. And people come to me, Dr. Sumaya here is an audit tutor. People ask, what audit should we do? We need an audit. It helps us in getting a job in the UK. But what audit should I do? So many audits are going on in the world. So these are all audits which are the part of the National Diabetes Audit in the UK. But we can do them here. If we establish a registry here, we can do them across the board. Otherwise, we can do it right into our center. So, so many areas in the diabetes service which are amenable to regular audits. Coming to the QI, the quality improvement. We talked about audit as a quality assurance tool. Now let's talk about quality improvement. And the main tool there are many tools, 
But the main tool I would like to discuss today is the model for improvement or the PDSA model for improvement. Also, confusingly, it's sometimes called quality improvement project, so QIPs. Now, remember audit was to make sure that you're meeting a standard. A QI, a QIP aims to improve the quality of care in a more holistic way. You, you want to improve the quality of care and it may not just be about standards. It may also be about improving the experience of care. So we do not just focus on standards, clinical standards and all that, but we go beyond that. Uh, again, people come to me, uh, we want to do a QIP, what do I do? Remember, for a QIP, you can't suddenly say that I want to start stem cell transplantation. It must be a validated intervention. It must be something which you can just place in there and nobody would blink an eye because it's a validated intervention. You can't go about experimenting here. Therefore, because it is like that, in most circumstances, IRB approval is not needed. You just go ahead and do a quality improvement project. And you do it in a systematic way. In fact, we're doing it all the time, aren't we? We're doing it all the time in our services. Someday we say, there's more rush at this time, so we uh, maybe uh, implement an appointment system for these category of patients, we triage our patients. We, we do that all the time. But if we do it systematically, we use certain tools to do it, we report it and record it in a certain way, it suddenly becomes a QIP. So why should I do it? Why should any of us do it? Because eventually all of us want to make a difference. We want to make a difference to the patient outcomes, to improve the system and to improve our own working conditions. Because nobody is going to be fighting for us, fighting with us and blaming us for things wrong. Because if we are doing our best, and for our students I say, it's a huge thing on a CV. You have this on your CV, you're guaranteed a job. Not in Pakistan. Inshallah in Pakistan. And then uh, for those who are in other parts of their career, it's a very high impact publication. Mostly because we feel that here is sakta. It's not like that. Here We have to learn that something is within my own grasp also which I can bring about a change. So what we have learned is helplessness. In our government hospitals, we can't do anything. It's not possible, madam to learn to overcome that. So that was my inspirational slide. I hope it inspired somebody. So how to do a QI project? What, are, what we discussed the audit as a uh, quality assurance toolkit. What is the QI project toolkit? It revolves around the PDSA cycle and the PDSA means plan, do, study, act. So planning is basically story, story uh, so we're going to be discussing in detail, but planning is a storyboarding, where you think, plan the whole thing, think about everything, then do is actually doing and seeing what happens, study, you actually see what you did, it actually, uh, what were the results of this? And based upon our results, do we want to go ahead and do it again? Do we want to change it in some way? Or, no, 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 it actually made things worse. Let's not do it again, right? So that is the PDSA cycle, but a bit about that. It's an iterative cycle. I call it PDSA repeat. So you can't just, um, like nothing in the world happens perfectly the first time unless you are uh, a very brilliant person, or you're, you get a hole in one, so it's mostly chance. But mostly you do it again cyclically, do something, maybe achieve a certain level of benefit. Then do something else, achieve some more benefit, till eventually this long road of improvement leads you to where you want it to go. So this is how PDSA cycles occur again, again, and again, till you come for where you want to go. So, as I promised, toolkit. So the plan, do, study, act cycle. We begin with plan. Plan is when you sit in your office and you think about the project. You brainstorm, you understand, and you define what you're going to do. And you make it very, very specific. So what are the tools? First of all, when people are asking you, your students are asking you, what is the topic? Madam, topic, batai. Just look into your own system. What works well, you probably don't want to change that. 
but what does not work well what frustrates you what you brings you um, i mean day in day out you can't sort of like do anything about it it's making you unhappy do it for yourself that is the topic where you can do it that and there's so many areas in diabetes service maybe you getting bad uh, bad prescriptions day in day out from your juniors so maybe you want to start a decision support electronic medical record system which helps them take the right decisions your patients don't know what to eat maybe you want to start a group education said maybe dr amna here is some uh, dr amna is somewhere she has just started a diabetic foot clinic entirely out of her own initiative very good because day and night you see patients coming in wheelchair with uh, foot amputated so you can do something about that and so many so other things so who should we do it should it be your house officer should it be your nurse should it be the consultant should it be the principal basically anybody and everybody can do a health who is involved in healthcare delivery can do a qip but when you start a qip i shouldn't be doing it in a surgical ward it should be in my own domain i should be the one who is actually capable of doing something there and if anybody is going to be affected by that system they should be on board and if i expect anybody to take on a project with extra work they should be on board so you make a team you make an improvement team and after having done that then you sit and make a very realistic what we call a smart aim we are very fond of this word smart so write down the aim put in a time parameters we will do it in so many times we will do this who will do this it's realistic i'm it's not i doing something in the surgical ward it's so then at the end of having done that that help you clarify your thoughts and having done your smart aim now you need to have understand the process there are some tools and i'm just going to give you screenshots of them because it's a full workshop understanding how to use these tools so um a diabetes care service as an example but anything else the person coming to the emergency it's generally a process go to counter a get something from counter a go to counter b do that counter 3 you wait counter 4 you do that so there is generally process so if you draw a something like this this is a process map it will help you see that exactly where is a duplication where there is a break where what is working well and where what is the main point your priority area which you need to fix and what is just being done for no what no good reason whatsoever trust me in a lot of our services a lot of things are being done for no good reason so it helps you and identify that and get rid of that so this is still remember it's part of your plan cycle you're sitting in your office with your improvement team you've written a specific aim and now you are making your progress you you finally first step you got a big board and you're writing this you're making this process map or if you're very good at the computer you can actually there are softwares for that having done that maybe you can reduce some of the steps with the patient unnecessarily goes through and now you've identified a problem you need to find out exactly why this problem is occurring because problem is good to identify but you need to fix the problem so you want to find out why the problem is occurring and there are many tools for that but i am going to only share one with you which i call the driver diagram uh, not i call it it's known as driver diagram because it's a very favorite of people who are doing qips and it's a very very important thing which occurs in the qip presentations so driver diagram looks like this basically uh it looks at the goal and this is what you say you want to make sure that your patient with pregnant woman gets a uh, ogtt timely then what are the factors which will bring this about sometimes those factors are again multifactorial and having done that it breaks your uh, task into bite sized pieces piece and each of these pieces then becomes one pdsa cycle which you can do and fix that and it will bring about a little bit of change and then you move on to the next one that will bring some change then the third one so this is a driver diagram basically it's the drivers which you need to fix which you need to achieve to actually achieve your goal so again this is a very complicated thing which requires at least a good session but i wanted to familiarize you with this 
So you did your storyboarding, you did your brainstorming, you made your plans, you found out the root cause, you decided an aim, you s we are going to do that, you had a team who's going to do that. Now, it's time to get out of that office chair and actually do something. So the do part of the cycle. When you're doing something, example, you wanted to fix the number of patients who were not coming for timely OGTTs. So um, you had only 50% and you wanted to go to 100%. And you've planned in six months time we were going to do this. Imagine you've started an intervention and you're waiting for six months, finding out, in fact, you went from 50% to 40%. Or six months later, you're still at 50%. So it's not good enough to do that. Instead, may I have five minutes? Or, okay, I'll, I'll wrap it up. So it looks something like this. It's an example of a run chart where with time you can see whether your interventions are working or not. And it can help tell you, attract changes and trends anyway. Then you study the results. And finally, depending upon whether it worked or not, you can adapt, adopt, and modify. So going on, this is in a nutshell what I talked about. But we have a bonus step. You should actually be able to write down your QIP, and you should publish it. So there are guidelines. So there's a link down at the bottom. So Squire guidelines help you in how to write this. And there's a journal, very high impact journal, where you can actually publish them. But beyond that, so this is how I wanted to show you. This is a poster of a QIP. See the tools. These are the tools which are being used, the driver diagrams, the run charts, which help you in actually uh, the PDSA cycles. So this is how you can transform an idea into your brain into a very good poster. This is an award-winning poster I wanted to share with you. And then you can present these posters, you can network in the quality community, big conferences are occurring, you can take a part of that. And final part, does evidence actually say that these approaches influence diabetes outcomes? So there is this meta-analysis, and they did a range of improvement strategies. Uh, and they wanted to see how it influenced statin use, aspirin use, and then in fact, it, how it influenced outcomes such as HPA1C, cholesterol, blood pressure, and in fact, the results say, across the board, whatever strategies they used, it led to glycemic improvement, it led to cholesterol improvement, it led to blood pressure improvement, these strategies do make a difference, the evidence supports that. So in summary, we should be doing it because we can actually even bring about an improvement in outcomes. So what about our patient we started off with? We talked about expectations. The standards say she should have pre-pregnancy counseling, self-management education, a certain period of time, anomaly scanning should be done, the management of a diabetic patient labor is, has its own ways and means, care of infants. The quality, this is quality assurance, you meet these standards. The quality improvement is how can you holistically bring about a change which helps in meeting these standards but goes beyond that. So you can start up a dedicated diabetes and pregnancy clinic. You can have a dietitian draw up diet charts for these women. You can liaison with radiology so that their anomaly scanning it doesn't become a frustrating experience. And uh, the, you can develop flow sheets for labors. And you can liaise with the neonatology to make sure that the infant or diabetic mother is, um, gets the protocol of treatment is needed, which it needs. My take home message is, that to bring about a change, we need to change the system. Because as long as we keep on doing the same thing day in, day out, it is guaranteed that the same results will always occur. Nothing magical is going to happen. So to bring about a change, you need to change the system. And this is an apolitical statement. So thank you so much. And uh, uh, I believe I've run out of time, but any questions? Okay, thank you so much.